And for David, he is at a teaching conference this week. Well, my name is Liana. I teach in the English department. But if you have questions, you can ask a TA or send him an email. He's going to be back on Monday, just for your reference, okay? Uh, remember to check the Google Calendar and Canvas for any cultural events to be attending. And make sure that you complete the Sky Better response, which is going to open right after this convocation, okay? Um, so Sydney, our speaker today, needs to leave immediately after his presentation, so he's not going to be able to stick around to, you know, field questions after convocation. But that being said, he should give us a, a really good rundown in his talk. So I'm going to turn it over to Dimitri, who will introduce our speaker for you. Oh. <laughs> when we old professors close the doors, we always have the same discussion, and there's two essential questions. One, does Dimitri need a haircut? And the answer is yes. And two, how is education changing, and what can we do about it? And the answer to that, as far as I'm concerned, being a dance teacher, it's not changing for dance. Dance is about bodies and space and time. It's about intimacy, sweat, blood, and tears. So what's going to change that? I think that in the privacy of my nice Mentai house, when I'm well fed, well slept, and then I come and teach here, and the reality is different. Already on my way to teaching, I'm checking my Facebook, seeing how many likes I got. And then when my students ask me, can we take a nap? I, being a democratic teacher, say, but of course. And we go to Shavasana, and I turn off the lights, and I see at least four cell phones still lit. So we are at a stage where we can't even take a nap without the help of a cell phone. And after that, my brain shuts off. That's all I know. And that's why we bring intelligent people like Sydney here that would help us untangle those conundrums. Sydney is visiting us from Brown University. Dance Magazine calls him the most important man working in dance today. He knows about avatars, interfaces. Being Russian, I have no idea what an interface is. He is here to unpack what are we going into and how are the robots going to change it all for dance and consequently for all of us. So without further ado, Sydney Sky Better. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning or afternoon. It's hard to tell what time it is in this Battlestar Galactica of a building. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, your kind invitation. Um, hi, how are you all doing? Woo. One person, two people responded with woo. So that's uh, galvanizing. Um, one thumbs up. Thank you. Uh, thumbs up to you as well. Um, so, uh, hi, I'm, my name is Sydney Skybetter. I'm a choreographer. Uh, and professor at Brown University. Um, and, and my understanding uh, in this engagement today um, is that all of you saw the uh, poster of my awkward face and uh, decided that that is clearly an event that you have to go see, and that is why you're all here. Also, many of you are compelled to be here because of class. Is that right? Yeah, OK, great. Um, so acknowledging that, <laughs> a lot of nods on that one. Um, so uh, acknowledging that many of you are literally forced to attend this lecture, um, I wonder uh, if there's anything I can do for you uh, to make this not terrible. Um, so uh, are there any questions that you would like me to address in advance of my uh, talk and stuff? Uh, any uh, tips, tricks, things that I can do to be not boring to you? A joke. Oh, um, I, will, I will attempt. My, my, my uh, humor comes from the uh, Jewish-Yiddish tradition, so some of it's in Yiddish. I'll, I'll see what I can do. Uh, most of it's untranslatable, um, but that means it's filthy. Um, other thoughts, uh, <laughs> comments, um, things that I can talk about uh, be useful to you for? Yeah, OK. So then what, how about this? Um, I'm going to uh, yell uh, to, at you about the future of art and emerging technologies. Feel free to uh, yell or holler or throw soft objects at me um, to indicate uh, that you have a question or that you want to uh, engage in some kind of commentary. Um, I'm going to save a little bit of time at the end for Q&A, um, and then um, we'll see where it goes. Does that sound OK? Seem like a plan? Did somebody yell something? No? We're good? We're good. You ready for this? Yeah. Yeah. One, two, three people are ready. Four, five, seven to 10. OK, let's do this. Um, so I, I just want to um, point out, um, wow, I just got louder there. Uh, so for your reference, I, I do a lot of uh, research in uh, national security. Um, this is an image taken from the National Security Agency's uh, archives. That's um, uh, an image of uh, John Travolta slash Mitt Romney 
um, saying, um, security fever, catch it. That's it. <laughs> That's, um, this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, and uh, I guess let's jump right in. Give it up for our robot overlords. Um, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was uh, grocery shopping with my family, as you do um, in uh, Rhode Island. I, I come to you from Rhode Island. Um, and the big sort of grocery store there is called Stop and Shop, um, because you stop uh, your uh, life and go grocery shopping. And um, that's, uh, but in, in this case, I, I literally was stopped in my tracks um, by this uh, robot that I'd like to introduce you to. Um, so this is a, a grocery store uh, attendant. Um, this is a, a robot um, produced by a company based in Massachusetts called Badger Technologies. Um, and, and what this robot, this is a spill detection robot. It exists only to uh, detect spills. Um, it doesn't do anything about the spill, um, but it, it very helpfully uh, tells uh, attendants at the stop and shop that a spill uh, has happened, I guess. Um, so I, I ran into this uh, robot at Stop and Shop somewhat unexpectedly because I don't go to the grocery store expecting a seven-foot-tall, googly-eyed robot to just, like, be there hanging out with me, I guess. Um, and so I took a picture of it in the, um, the boar's head cheese uh, aisle, I guess. And um, I w it was pointed out to me by, by, by my wife as I was taking this picture um, that I was making some kind of, like, screwball face. Uh, and I didn't believe her at the moment, but then I took a picture of my face uh, on the opposite side of my phone. And indeed, this is sort of the... The look, um, and we, I, I was just so struck by this Fakakta robot that um, this is sort of the, I mean, this, this robot is dead inside, right? Like, this is, a, uh, this is, uh, this is our future, um, folks. Um, and uh, so I, I found myself very interested in, in how this uh, uh, robot sort of worked and, and functions. Um, and it turns out we, we have an expectation of semi-autonomous robots um, of which this is one, that the robot is like capable of doing stuff, right? That in this case, um, spill detection. Um, you, you would think that the robot by itself of its own accord would like be able to like be like, oh yeah, that's a spill. Um, it turns out that this robot uh, is in fact not able to do that. Um, what, the way that this robot works um, is it, uh, when it goes up and down uh, the pre-planned uh, sort of a map of the aisles of the store, um, and it, when it runs into something that's blocking its path, um, that could be a spill, um, it doesn't actually know if it's a spill or not, because it's a fairly dumb robot. What it does is it takes a picture of the thing that may or may not be a spill, and it beams that picture to the Philippines. And an underpaid worker in the Philippines is paid to look at uh, an image of a thing that may or may not be a spill and click yes or no. If yes, um, then the image goes back to the robot from the Philippines, and then that robot um, sends a, an alert to all of the staff members uh, at the stop and shop, letting them know that a spill probably happened in whatever aisle the, the robot is in. This robot costs $30,000, and uh, it exists to email people in the Philippines. Um, and, and this, for me, is sort of an uh, object lesson um, in how technologies are seemingly automagical, right? They seem to just know how things work and know how to operate within our world, but in fact, they're heavily dependent on sources of labor that are frequently rendered invisible. Um, but this isn't the end of, of this awkward story. Um, you know, the, the robot, it's not smart, as uh, discussed. Um, so as I was checking out with my family um, at the stop and shop, um, the robot sort of made a beeline across the sort of checkout aisle and up the like apple juice aisle, I guess. Um, and there, there's this woman um, who had a full um, cart of laun uh, not laundry, that would have been surprising, cart of groceries, um, and she just like, w was in the middle of the aisle and was deeply uninterested in getting out of this robot's way. Now this robot, it's, it's tall, it's fairly menacing despite its googly-eyed appearance, um, and ordinarily people just get out of the way of the robot. Like we're, we're acculturated to get out of the way of the robot. This woman, who clearly had zero F-bombs left, um, did not want to get out of the way of the robot, and in fact, um, stood her ground waiting for the robot to get out of her way. So she's in the middle of the apple juice aisle with a full thing of groceries and just staring down the robot, um, ironically. Uh, and uh, the robot is trained to kind of go around obstacles, so it like rotated 15 degrees and like tried to go around, but the woman's still not moving and is not uh, able to go around the one, so he, he rotates again, and then the woman's just like standing there, not happy. Um, and my, my three-year-old, um, who has a, a real kind of gift for um, knowing uh, when an awkward thing is about to happen. Um, she uh, comes up to the robot and starts like doing kind of like a robot like dance like around the robot. Uh, and the robot now is confused because it has like a really cranky uh, woman on one hand uh, and then a three-year-old dancing around it on the other. And the robot is just kind of like desperately looking for an out, right? The robot is not like not, not trained 
to deal with three-year-olds and cranky um, women with large, heavy groceries. Um, and then the, 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 the kind of the tension um, kind of keeps building here, and the robot keeps like moving and failing to get out of the woman's way. And then the woman, who just, it just does not want to be there at this point, starts taking her grocery cart and ramming the robot with the groceries. And, and my three-year-old, who is not one to be uh, left out of a, an act of random violence, starts kicking the robot and, and like, punching the robot, and the robot's just like, ah, what the fuck, ineffectually uh, moving around. And then um, I am watching all of this, making the face that you just saw, just like, uh, and, and then I, I realized that if my three-year-old, um, you know, damages a $30,000 robot, I would be on the hook for that. So I, I sweep up the, the three-year-old, and, and then eventually the robot gets out of the woman's way, and, you know, the moment, thankfully, uh, passes. Um, but this brings me to sort of a, a hypothesis of my talk today, namely that the, the medium between uh, an, uh, an object of unwanted surveillance and a surveillant entity itself, the medium between those two things frequently is violence. Welcome to my TED talk. So, I, I know, that, that went on for like a full half second longer than I anticipated. Um, God's eye. Uh, uh, so my, my work as a choreographer um, is to think about how bodies move through space and time. And, and uh, by dint of my uh, training, I have a, a dance historical sort of lens for how these things work and how they evolve over time. Uh, my expertise, ultimately, in choreography is in bodies, in how bodies move through space and time and how that generates meaning of various sorts. Um, for a long time, that expertise was wielded for the sake of generating dances uh, that exist on stages like this one for audiences such as yourselves. Increasingly, I am preoccupied with how our bodies perform, not for people, but for machines. Uh, this has a history, though, um, that I, I want to introduce you to now. Um, I want to take you to 16th century France. This is 1581. This is an engraving of what is arguably the first uh, ballet in the Western canon, Ballet Comique de la Reine. This is uh, orchestrated uh, and choreographed on some level by um, Balthazar de Beaujolais. Um, and uh, what choreography means in this context is very different from how we contemporarily understand things like ballet performance. You think of ballet contemporarily, there's a stage, and there's people with thigh gaps, and they do stuff like that, probably better than what I just did. Um, but in uh, 1581, ballet looked very different. Um, you'll notice, for example, that there are some two or three sort of balconades uh, of people looking down at the stage action, right? So this is functionally a kind of like dancerly narrator figure happening here. And the, the audiences are looking, uh, some of them are looking straight at the stage action, but functionally folks are looking down at the, uh, the movement of the, the dancers. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, they were looking down at the action was because uh, in 1581, uh, what people wore to, co uh, wore to court, uh, what they wore to dance was very different than what they wear now. Um, so in 16th century France, if you were a courtier, and you had to be to uh, partake in this uh, particular art form, um, let's see, you would, you would have something like uh, maybe as many as a dozen layers of panniers, like dresses on top of dresses, as well as just like pounds and pounds of really heavy jewelry. This was frequently engraved or in, in laced with gold, heavy metals. You also had like lead, literal lead paint on your face, um, as well as all kinds of stuff in your hair. Um, this was an era that would turn into, I think Marie Antoinette, uh, you know, uh, many years later, where her uh, wigs would have like boats in them, um, all sorts of really heavy objects that function as uh, costuming here. Um, and, and because of the weight of all of this costuming, it's, it's not, you can't, you can't do a lot, right? You can't like dance around super much when you're, uh, you're, the thing that you're wearing weighs like upwards of 50 pounds. And so what ballet consisted of at this point, what choreography consisted of at this point, is largely people walking around with their heavy costumes into shapes. And so what they would do is, you'd have like maybe a dozen people on stage at a moment, and they'd walk and walk and walk and walk, and they'd hit a shape. And then the audience would be like, that's a shape. And then they'd walk again, and then they'd make another shape, and then the audience would be like, ah, yes, that is a, a second shape. And then they'd do this for hours, hours at a time. Now, these shapes had significance, right? So this is a, a time when, for example, Nostradamus, who you might know from your grocery uh, aisle, the magazines, right? Um, a famous sort of semi-mathematician numerolo numerologist. Wow, I think I might have just had a stroke. Numerologist? Nailed it. Um, you know, he's very famous for, you know, uh, astrology, essentially. But N Nostradamus actually consulted on the uh, significance of shapes and numbers for early ballet. 
Um, and this is significant because uh, audience members looking at these shapes would also be very keyed in to the math and geometry of those movements, yeah? And we can see this to a certain extent also in dance notation. So this is an example about 100 years later of what came to be called beauchamp fouillet notation. And what we see at the top, this is uh, somewhat ironically, I suppose, um, this is a, a section of a dance, um, the, an entre grave pour homme, or the, the, the like, serious entrance of the man. Um, my French translation is theatrical. Anyway, um, what you see uh, on the top is a, a, a bar of music. Uh, and then this dance notation here um, has demarcations um, that correspond to the measures, right? And these uh, encodings here signify what was intended to uh, be, what was, uh, what was choreographed and what was intended to be performed uh, on the part of a dancer moving through space from above. So this God's eye view um, is a, a function both of uh, performance, how the dance was seen by 16th and century, uh, 16th and century, 16th and 17th century uh, audiences, I just had a second stroke, this should be alarming to you, um, as well as dance notation, which is again seen from the top with gestures encoded into the dance notation, right? Um, this notion of encoding, I think, is significant here because in a moment we're going to start talking Um, so how, how these things get encoded is very interesting to me because this, this dance notation functions algorithmically. Yeah? Um, also by way of uh, a certain anticipatory gesture, um, the ballet comique um, took as its subject the Greek myth of the goddess and necromancer, uh, I'm sorry, the witch and uh, necromancer Circe, uh, who we will uh, hear a little bit more from later. God's eye view. So I want to talk to you about Marauder's Map for a moment. This jumps forward some 300 or so uh, years. Um, uh, it's uh, 2015, uh, and I'm teaching dance history, and um, I'm teaching uh, it's Dance Like a Pirate Day, because it's Talk Like a Pirate Day, because that's apparently a holiday. Anyway, um, on uh, Dance Like a Pirate Day in my dance history class, uh, or in, in Talk Like a Pirate Day, we, we dance like pirates, and so in, in this class we reconstruct um, 16th and 17th century uh, pirate dances, because this is a thing um, that you can get paid to do, apparently. Um, and uh, while I'm uh, uh, doing this, uh, this teaching, I, I see, um, or in, in, in my class preparation for doing this teaching, I get a Facebook notification um, that somebody has been unceremoniously fired from Facebook for uh, creating uh, something called Marauder's Map. How, any, any of you familiar with Marauder's Map in the Harry Potter? One person, can you yell out what Marauder's Map is? Exactly. Perfect. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause for the, the volunteer of Marauder's Map? Thank you. That is a perfect, very enthusiastic clapping. That is a perfect <laughs> description of Marauder's Map. So Harry Potter, um, I have not read all these books. There's a lot of them. They're very long. Um, but Marauder's Map is like a magical object within uh, the Harry Potterverse, I guess, that um, reveals the, like, the real uh, and present location of like, all of the ghostly like, artifacts and like, people and like, magical creatures and, and stuff. I didn't read these books, obviously, so I don't really know what's going on. I know about Marauder's Map, though. But think of it, uh, Marauder's Map as a kind of God's eye approach to the Harry Potter-verse, right? Um, so what, what I, I learned in this day uh, while I'm uh, teaching folks to dance like pirates um, is that somebody at, at Harvard, uh, not at Harvard, at, at Facebook got fired um, because uh, they created a program called Marauder's Map, which did a very similar thing. What Marauder's Map did was it revealed the current and previous location of every Facebook Messenger user on the planet. At the time, there was like a billion people on Facebook Messenger, right? Um, so what this uh, Marauder's Map uh, browser plugin did uh, was it uh, basically allowed people to access um, geolocation data um, that was encoded within the messages sent from Facebook Messenger. Um, so this um, is a screen grab from Marauder's Map at the time before it was shut down. Um, this is uh, the movement of an individual across time in Palo Alto. Um, now, I just want to say this one more time. Um, a billion people were affected by this. Um, and now maybe you know, five years later or something, we take for granted that we're being constantly surveilled and our location is known to any application on our phone. Uh, but at the time, uh, many of us sort of assumed that Facebook was collecting this data, but we didn't really know for sure until this. What we learned from this moment, um, from this browser plugin, um, was that A, Facebook is always collecting your location data and is apparently able to monetize that in various ways. Secondly, Facebook does not secure this information very carefully. Um, Marauder's Map provided a God's eye view of a billion people's movements through space and time, and face the Facebook algorithm worked to attempt to assign meaning to those movements. 
Now, this, for me, was a, a radical departure. Um, it, it suggested to me that there was a way of algorithmically viewing movement through space and time, computing that in a way that generated meaning. Now, this, for me, is a choreographic problem, the generation of meaning from bodies moving through space and time. And it was astonishing to me at the moment that a, a transnational behemoth like Facebook would be preoccupied with our bodies as such. This got me interested in figuring out more about this unveiling, uh, this uh, emerging landscape of surveillance technologies that were deeply preoccupied with our bodies, with our movements, with our intentions. God's eye view indeed. Co-traveler. A couple years um, before Marauder's Map, uh, it was revealed by way of Edward Snowden that there was a top secret program that the National Security Agency uh, was working through called Co-Traveler. And what Co-Traveler did um, was a very similar thing to Marauder's Map, except internationally. Basically, um, if you were a person of interest to the National Security Agency, your cell phone, in all likelihood, was being tracked uh, in terms of its geolocation. And, and I just have a, a quick diagram of this. This is by way of the Washington Post. Um, think of uh, cell phone triangulation and cell phone uh, location data um, being relative to cell phone towers, right? So every time your phone is on, well, no, actually that's not true. Every time you have a phone, that phone's location is constantly being mapped according to a, a triangulated map between cell phone towers, yeah? Um, and what uh, the co-traveler program did was it uh, mapped the location of persons of interest across cell towers around the world. And what this algorithm, this set of algorithms did, was it, it uh, attempted to generate affinity maps of other people co-traveling with an individual uh, who is an individu individual of interest. So for example, um, if you are a, a, a target of the NSA, let's say you, you move through um, this sort of region here uh, into this region B. Yeah, so region A into region B. Um, and now if there, there's going to be a certain number of random people who travel with you from uh, location A to location B, and then an even smaller number going from B to C, an even smaller number from C to D, D to E, E to F, et cetera. Now, what the NSA managed to figure out was the math that uh, was able to uh, figure out who was co-traveling with an under, another individual through space and time. And on the basis of a certain quantity uh, of uh, movement through space and time, of a certain duration of space and time, the NSA thought that that was suggestive of affinity. That means that if you were a person of interest, anybody that you co-traveled with through a certain duration of space and time was also then put on a watch list. Uh, a random uh, a number, like so any, uh, there's, there's a random uh, assortment of people, assortment of people moving through space and time, and if you were one of the unfortunate ones to co-travel or with a person of interest, that may be enough to not let you go on a, an airplane or a train or move between countries. This is another early uh, uh, program that is suggestive of the, the signifying power of our movements through space and time, specifically relative to algorithms. This is a computational system that didn't really have anybody at the head of it. Nobody was watching this data unfold. Rather, an algorithm would tell, uh, for example, airports who to arrest on site as a result of this data. Um, so co-traveling. I should pause because I've, I've apparently had two strokes. I might be uh, speaking in French. Um, is, how am I doing so far? Is this making sense? Is this, again, two thumbs up from over here? Um, questions, thoughts, comments so far? Bodies, space, and time. Is this making sense? Are we okay? Are we friends still? Are we okay? Yeah. Want to know more? Should I? Is it, yeah. Continue. Okay. Feel free to stop me and tell me to talk about, I don't know, sports or something at some point, but I'm just going to keep going. Thank you for your tolerance. So, um, I want to talk to you about another military program um, called Gorgon Stare. Um, this was um, revealed by a gentleman named uh, Arthur Holland Mitchell um, at Bard. Um, he recently wrote a book called uh, Enemy, uh, not Enemy of the State, uh, Eyes in the Sky. Um, about uh, this military program, um, specifically about how um, folks working at CIA and NSA were so inspired by the 1999 Will Smith movie, Enemy of the State, um, that they decided to create a surveillance program based on it. So how many of you have seen that uh, Enemy of the State movie? Two people. That, yeah, thank you, two people, for seeing that terrible garbage fire of a movie. Much obliged. Oh, it was, I mean, it's two hours and 40 minutes long. I mean, Will Smith has his moments, right? But it, it's, and Seth Green is kind of like, really, Seth Green? Anyway, um, <laughs> you didn't come here for my uh, opinions on Seth Green. Um, you came here because you were forced to. Anyway, um, so uh, <laughs> Enemy of the State is this movie where Will Smith, um, is, uh, he plays a lawyer. He's falsely accused of um, some kind of espionage or whatever. The plot is 
uh, flimsy at best. Um, but what, uh, what uh, I know, uh, we can argue about this in Q&A. Um, but what happens uh, is that Will Smith um, sets into motion this chain of events where he's being tracked by satellites and all kinds of surveillance stuff that as of 1999 did not yet exist. It was a speculative fiction about a surveillance future. And, and so uh, folks from NSA were like, that movie's cool, we should build that. And then they did. Um, so Gorgon Stare is a military program um, that uh, packed cameras onto the bodies of drones, Reaper drones in particular. Um, and what that enabled folks to do um, was to, uh, they basically created an artificial intelligence that mined this visual data from the drone. Uh, and th now the visual power of this drone is really quite prodigious. It was really prodigious. It's only gotten more powerful, of course. Um, but basically, with a single drone, you could surveil something like 40 or 50 square miles uh, of, a, of a city, right? This is the, more or less the entire city center of Baghdad. This is most of Baltimore. This is most of Detroit. And by the way, these are all cities that have been surveilled under the Gorgon Stair program. Now, one of the particularly interesting things about Gorgon Stair from my perspective is that the, uh, the computational system itself was able to locate particular gestures performed by cars moving through space and time uh, and assigned a suspicion score on the basis of their movement. So this is a, uh, this is a still from a, a early, I think this is 2014, uh, image of the, the uh, Gorgon or Persistent Surveillance Program. Um, and these, these, are, these are cars, right? So this is pixelated. It, it's not super high definition yet. Um, but what the Gorgon Stare Program was able to do was it was able to track tens of thousands of multiple simultaneous entities. So every car within the 50 mile square radius or whatever of the Gordon Stair uh, program um, would be co continuously monitored. And all of its movements, all the movements of those objects tracked. And if any one of those tens of thousands of objects moved in a way that the drone thought was suspicious, that would get that object put on a list. So some of the gestures, for example, that would get you on uh, a watch list vis-a-vis uh, -vis Gorgon Stair include a sudden U-turn. So if you do a U-turn and the drone is watching, uh, your car is now going to be probably watched. Um, other things include um, the passing of a car repeatedly. So if you've ever uh, passed a car repeatedly, that is a gesture that the drone would understand as being suspicious. Um, or um, if you follow too closely behind somebody else, that is also a suspicious gesture, right? So how many of you have ever done a U-turn? Okay, sure. How many of you have ever been followed by another uh, car a little too closely? Yeah, sure. How many of you have ever passed another vehicle? Great. This should go to, <laughs> thank you for your participation. This should go to show you on some level the kind of choreographic arbitrariness of the signals that a military program was using to ascertain suspicion. Yeah? And I want to be really clear here about the ramifications of being viewed as suspicious by either a police state or by the military. This is one of the ways that our, our, uh, our military decides who to drone strike. So if your car is suspicious and relatively correlated to other suspicious activities, your car could get missiled. I heard both nervous laughter and I think somebody said sick. <laughs> yes, all, all of that is correct. Sick on all of the registers of that, what that word means now. Um, so this, to me, represents, again, a moment of the choreographic or signifying power and failures of these computational systems as they try to understand our movements through space and time. Yeah? Um, this program has not um, ended. There are many more like it. Um, if anything, uh, this used to be an, a, a program that existed primarily abroad. Uh, it is now being invited into our cities. There are any number of domestic contractors who specialize in this kind of surveillance, uh, and it's coming for us all. Question. Mm. Mm -hmm. is there, the question is, is there surveillance of, of this sort maybe that incorporates audio? Uh, the answer is yes. So for example, um, in uh, New York City, um, there has been a controversial program that installed listening microphones um, onto street posts. The idea being that if someone were to fire a gunshot, these listening posts would be able to triangulate approximately the location of the gunfire and then send people to uh, that site, right? It turns out, though, um, that this well-intentioned program, um, you know, maybe, mm, let me try that again, that this program um, uh, would I identify a lot of sounds that kind of sound like gunfire uh, uh, and then send lots of police to um, largely um, black neighborhoods. So, for example, um, a car backfiring sounds an awful lot like a gunshot. 
Um, so the police would, uh, New York City police, would come to sites where people were just having car trouble, and they would expect gunfights. This is the, the stakes of this kind of surveillance. Yeah? Uh, another maybe more consumer-grade uh, uh, version of this kind of surveillance, audio specifically, is Alexa or uh, Siri. Um, how many of you have um, Alexas or Siris? Yeah, totally. Um, so th these are technologies that are, are designed to be cute, designed to be functional, but they are literally always listening to you. Uh, and also, not only are they listening to you, they are literally always recording you. Uh, and you will never have access to that recording data, um, but the DOD will. The state does. And if forever, uh, if at any point you were um, accused of a crime, they would be able to access every audio file that your Alexa ever created. So imagine all of that awkwardness that your Alexa listens to. Yeah, the, that exists on a server somewhere. Yes? Uh-huh. Uh, sure, but there's also a question of, and this is maybe a, a subject for another talk on some level, but the, the fact of our not owning our own digital footprint, um, how we as individuals do not own the data that we nonetheless produce and that is monetized variously by other entities. Um, so, co-traveler uh, and Gorgon Stare. Um, I want to uh, maybe, uh, this is all very kind of down and uh, heavy, and uh, my apologies for that. Um, I want to uh, talk to you about Uptown Spot. Um, have you uh, seen this video? Um, let me show you this uh, robot here. Um, you seen this one? Oh, let's see. military uh, robotics company um, based uh, a couple miles away from me in Massachusetts called Boston um, uh, uh, Dynamics and um, uh, Boston Robotics. And uh, what, what this uh, robot is, is uh, it came from military funding, right? So um, MIT, it was a spinoff from the MIT Media Lab. Um, and it's a, a company that has produced a lot of music videos, a lot of videos of its robots doing stuff. So for example, there was a video that came out of, of, of Atlas. Um, it was a giant bipedal robot that could do things like flips. Maybe some of you saw this. Um, there's also, thank you, uh, um, there's also a video um, where like a dude with like, a hockey stick was like kind of like pushing one of these robots like off of its um, axis and the, the video was demonstrating that the robot was able to like recenter itself and continue with its, its task. Um, so th this is a company though that has produced a lot of online content that attempts to sort of humanize um, its, its, its robots, which is maybe um, ironic on some level given that these robots are designed to uh, carry things such as weapons uh, for the military. Um, and, and looking at that video as a choreographer, like on, on one hand, like I, I see like a, it's, it's cute, right? Like it, it's like a, a quadra, it's like a puppy robot that's dancing to Bruno Mars. I mean, what's not to uh, love about that? Um, except maybe the robot part and uh, depending on how you feel about Bruno Mars, maybe the Bruno Mars aspect. Um, in any event, as a choreographer, as somebody who's deeply preoccupied with performance, um, I'll, I'll be candid, I, I didn't really know how to read that. I don't know how to read uh, military robots that are able to dance and do uh, choreography and indeed perform. Um, Cirque du Soleil, which is the, one of the largest uh, live arts uh, companies on, on the planet, it's known uh, mostly for its, its circus work, it has a healthy presence in Las Vegas. Um, Cirque du Soleil um, is, in, is in, in a research phase with uh, Boston Dynamics to hire uh, these robots to do tricks and perform with it in live performance environments. So the next time you go to Las Vegas for a show, there's a non-zero chance that you'll see one of these military robots doing choreography uh, at the circus. And again, for me, I don't quite have a, a or I didn't at the moment, have a, a critical vocabulary to really understand what that meant. It's very ominous to me. It's very strange to me that something like dance or performance would be wielded um, for potential military application. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm still not fully comfortable with it. 
Um, but it turns out, though, that dance history is full of examples of choreography um, being wielded in various uh, militaristic ways. Napoleon uh, brought his entire ballet company with him to the Algiers. Um, Jennifer Homans, the, the dance historian, referred to ballet as an adjunct martial art because of how it was co-taught uh, along with equestrianism and fencing. There's a deep history of dance um, existing alongside military and martial interest. Um, this, this robot is only the latest and, and maybe most extreme version of that history. Uptown Spot. Um, chosen family nerd gaggle. Um, I, as I've mentioned before, like my, my expertise is in bodies moving through space and time, and there's a lot that I don't understand about this. There's a lot that I don't understand about our future. I'm not an expert in robotics. I'm not an expert in computer science. I'm just trying to understand how these things move forward and affect all of ourselves, our corporeal, fleshy selves. Um, but one of the ways that I've, I've been trying to uh, generate understanding around this stuff is by having a convening at Brown University every year called the Conference for Research on Choreographic Interfaces, or CIRCE for short. Um, at this gathering, which um, started out with me uh, receiving um, state funding to make a dance, um, I received a fellowship from the state of Rhode Island to make a new dance, um, and instead I turned that uh, $5,000 or whatever into train tickets and tequila. And um, then we had our first uh, academic convening uh, on the subject of the future of bodies and emerging technology. We've been doing it now for five years. Um, this is a nerd gaggle that attempts to foreground those of us with experience uh, and expertise in the arts and put us into dialogue with those of us who have expertise in science, technology, engineering, and math. Now, these, uh, these conferences, um, they have a lot of, um, indeed, alcohol, um, but also bagels and barbecue. Um, but also, it's an attempt to situate artists and technologists uh, who can collaborate with each other equitably. Um, there's been a lot, for example, how many of you have ever heard of STEM or STEM to STEAM? Yeah, so th this is a, an effort to um, bring the arts into STEM. STEM here being uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. You add arts to that, you go from STEM to STEAM. That seemed really funny uh, maybe uh, 20 years ago. It's significantly less interesting now. Um, one, of, one of the effects of the STEM to STEAM movement was the incorporation of artists uh, in kind of inequitous ways, uninteresting ways in engineering. So you had like a lot of like dancing volcanoes for no reason or like singing math equations for no reason. And that, that seems like kind of garbage to me. Um, one of the ways that this conference works then is to specifically and equitably situate artists to be in productive dialogue with scientists and technologists. Um, artists tend not to be foregrounded in this way, and so this is our attempt to uh, correct some of the politics involved uh, in that. But this is a gathering that is driven by curiosity and unknowing. Um, this is our attempt to come to know an emerging field of choreography and of computer science uh, it is our attempt to bring together the kinds of expertise, artists, and nerds who will be building out our shared future. Um, it's 106. I have to be, uh, when am I done? When do I get fired? 120? When is it? 10, what time do I have to be done? 120? Okay. <laughs> or, like, or sooner, whichever. Um, okay, so um, I want to um, kind of blitz through stuff so that we have a little extra time for uh, questions. Um, th really quickly, this is an artist in Berlin. This is an example of a kind of counter-surveillance choreography. This is Simon Wecker. Um, he's based uh, in Berlin, and what you, you, can, you can see here is that he is uh, toting behind him a radio flyer. That radio flyer is, is packed with 99 borrowed and rented cellular phones, each uh, tapped into Google Maps. Um, so they're all logged into Google Maps, and he's just sort of slowly ambling down a street in Berlin. Um, but what this has the effect of doing um, as uh, he walks with 99 um, phones that uh, Google Maps thinks are cars. Um, he's generating an algorithmic traffic jam. So you can see, um, this is oh, not quite in real time, um, but that this sort of red portion here where he's been walking, um, that is a traffic jam according to Google Maps. Google Maps is unable to functionally distinguish between a dude with a radio flyer full of uh, phones and an actual legit traffic jam. This is interesting to me choreographically because functionally Google Maps is a load distributing traffic system. Right? What it does is distribute traffic and uh, instruction, uh, driving instructions to people on the basis of where it thinks traffic is. So what, this, uh, what Simon did with his radio flyer full of cars, uh, <laughs> nope, radio flyer full of phones, um, is he uh, hacked Google Maps choreographically to make other bodies move through space and time differently. Um, now this is an example of a kind of artist um, who's doing really phenomenal work uh, in a kind of counter-surveillance choreography. Um, he's uh, hopefully going to be a speaker at CRC next year. Also notably, he's generating traffic around Google Berlin, um, which is a, a kind of a healthy FU to Google, perhaps. Um, this is an example of a kind of art, uh, artist 
uh, and art making that just didn't exist a couple years ago that I'm now through Searcy and at Brown trying to support and foreground. Um, I want to give a kind of inverse um, narrative of that. Um, thanks, but no. Um, so um, it was pointed out to me by my, by my sister recently as she was trying to find driving directions to my house in Rhode Island um, that actually the Google Maps Street View um, has uh, this image of me taking out my children from my Subaru. Um, that's my, uh, my oldest, that's my son right there. This is me circling around with my uh, son's lunch bag to get my uh, daughter who's in the um, backward facing car seat. That's my daughter looking at me. Um, there she is, unobstructed, undigitized, un uh, unoccluded. Um, and this represents a fairly quotidian moment in the life of my family. I, I pick up uh, my children from school every day. Um, I put them in the car, I take them out of the car, um, I pick up their lunches, I make sure that all of their crap is uh, out of the Subaru. Um, but for me, this represents uh, an awful incursion into my private life. This is an, a, a fairly uh, normal but nonetheless intimate moment between myself and my children uh, where I am in, uh, engaged in the act of parenting. And randomly, surreptitiously, in the year of our Lord, 2018, uh, a roving uh, a car packed with sensors captured a family portrait without my permission or consent. That's my daughter. That's my son. This is impossible to get off the internet. It will live longer than I will. There is no recourse for me to take these images off of the internet. Um, the data is not anything that I own or have any control over. The surveillance eventually comes for us all. Yes. This is available through Google Maps. Google Maps Street View. Um, so what I did was take screenshots of what it looks like when you do a Google Maps search for my house. And I just pasted those together uh, in a sequence. Uh, it goes to show you that um, the Google Maps apparatus, it's, it's not so much about, uh, it's not about maps. It's not so much about location. It's functionally a time machine. Um, it mines uh, location data for meaning across space and time. Here we are. Now, I'm a privileged sort, right? This is not going to harm me in any uh, discernible way. Um, but nonetheless, if I can be targeted in, uh, inadvertently by the surveillance apparatus, I want you to imagine uh, the ramifications of those of us who are on the receiving end of sexual harassment or abuse, those of us who have stalkers, those of us who have been accused wrongfully by the state. This kind of information, this kind of media uh, in the hands of, of those who would do us harm is prodigiously powerful. Surveillance comes for us all. Now, I want to close uh, with a, um, a line from one of my favorite poets and artists, David Wojnarowicz. Um, who passed away of complications due to AIDS, uh, no older than I am today. Um, he said, with enough gestures, we can deafen the satellites and lift the curtains surrounding the control room. This is from his Close to the Knives, and may it be so. Thank you. So. Thanks. Um, we have uh, eight minutes, um, give or take, um, to uh, talk about stuff. And um, I'm happy to uh, field questions on this presentation or talk about um, arts uh, and performance relative to emerging technologies or kind of literally whatever uh, you want to do. Um, so with that in mind, uh, thoughts, comments, questions, um, uh, revelations, uh, criticisms, critiques, or other uh, nouns or verbs or adjectives. What do you want to talk about? What's up? I'm just going to keep looking at you all awkwardly until somebody says something. Yes, please, hi. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the question is, is what can you do um, against this surveillance, maybe? Or what can you do to empower yourself against uh, an onslaught of, of these surveillance um, uh, entities? Uh, it's a great question, and there, are, uh, there is no satisfactory answers. There are no satisfying answers to this. Um, on, uh, this is because so many of these technologies have so ingratiated themselves uh, into our lives. They're so profoundly useful. Like on Facebook, for example. I know that Facebook is a malevolent, malicious company. Uh, I know that it's a garbage fire that's destabilizing our democracy. I know all of these things. And yet there is a social cost to my not participating in Facebook. My not participating in Facebook literally costs me money because I get work from Facebook. If I don't 
participate in Facebook, I can't do work. There's an ethical continuum here um, that uh, can be applied not just to Facebook, but to Google Maps, to Alexa, et cetera. Um, my, my suggestion uh, initially um, is first to, be, to try and become knowledgeable of the ways that these entities uh, interface with each other. Amazon is a really great example of a kind of consumer-oriented company that nonetheless collaborates uh, with the state and with our military in really profoundly dangerous ways. So for example, ring doorbells. Um, you're familiar with the ring system. Um, it's an Amazon technology that's uh, laden with things like facial recognition, body tracking, that sort of thing. Um, what's maybe less known is that um, Amazon, by way of Ring, negotiates contracts with local police stations, police um, uh, uh, entities, um, so that uh, if, for example, um, there is a suspicious movement that happens uh, around your house, um, the Ring uh, doorbell, door system, is able to not only um, see suspicious activity, but it alerts local police. Yeah? And this sounds good on some level, maybe, um, except that what the Ring understands to be suspicious um, disproportionately means that people of color are close to your house. That people uh, who are recognized as suspicious by the algorithm are moving in such a way that the police need to be summoned without your consent or knowing. So one of my first suggestions would be to not buy a ring doorbell. Yeah? Um, also, not buy an Alexa. Yeah? Um, these, these technologies, um, the, they don't affect uh, privileged folks uh, nearly as malevolently as they do uh, folks of color and folks without the privileges that we share here in this room. Um, the other thing I would say is to put pressure on these entities. There are ways um, that we can engage uh, and unionize and collaborate with workers in uh, the technology field um, because there are rooms where these decisions are made. There are rooms where people make decisions about how to track and surveil our bodies. Uh, and if you can't be in these rooms, maybe we should all try to be in those rooms. And if you can't be, then maybe we know people who are and we can affect them. This is a work of organizing and of affinity. This is why I convene a conference in instead of like writing on a blog. This is ultimately something that we will have to collectively organize against. Um, so I don't have a good answer for you, except that it will require a profound amount of organizing and unrest to disentangle ourselves from these uh, malevolent actors. Um, thank you. Um, other thoughts, questions, comments? What do you want to talk about? Yeah, please. Yeah. So the question is, um, does the, the government, does, does the state have an apparatus to maybe constellate or pull from all of these different uh, forms of data to make uh, decisions about like what is suspicious, who's on what, what watch list, that kind of thing? Um, the short answer is yes. The longer answer is they don't do it super well. And the longer answer still is that that they don't do it well is alarming. Um, so after 9-11, uh, um, there was a profound reorganization uh, within, uh, the, within uh, the, the United States uh, government, specifically having to do with data privacy and surveillance. Um, there are now um, any number of, of uh, sort of meta uh, state agencies that function specifically to pass data back and forth, for example, between like NSA and CIA, uh, CIA or the military uh, and the Navy, et cetera. There's all these sort of centralizing data repositories that can then be um, sort of meta-analyzed for uh, signs of suspicion or um, violent uh, activity. Um, but this uh, data is nonetheless still profoundly partial and also prone to inequitous uh, forms of uh, targeting and racism. So the fact that the government does indeed have ways to pull and constellate all this data and the fact that it does so poorly uh, should be alarming. Um, other thoughts, questions, comments? Oh, I'm, so, um, I'm sorry, uh, the person in the back, please, yes. With or against what? All of it. Sure. Um, so the question is, am I like pro or against these kinds of technologies? Yeah. Um, so the, the answer is, uh, it's complicated, right? There is no particular these sorts of technologies uh, in the sense that like I pulled from robotics, I pulled from um, classified uh, algorithms, um, I, I pulled from uh, drones. Like there, there is no, there's very little that these th technologies have in common except a preoccupation with our bodies. Um, now uh, we, had a, uh, we had a brief conversation earlier about um, our owning our own data rights, 
uh, and being uh, able to know whether we are being surveilled uh, in particular ways. Right now, we are not entitled uh, to know or own our own data. I think knowing and owning our own data would be, and this is uh, legislation that is currently in the works um, in uh, Congress, and actually another thing that you can do, by the way, um, to work against some of these technologies is vote. Vote for uh, uh, legislators who are knowledgeable of these technologies, who you trust to make decisions that are in your best interest relative to these technologies. Uh, Democracy is not dead yet. Um, I'm not pro or against any of these technologies on their face or in general. I'm not against robots, right? I'm not against things that fly. Rather, I'm against uh, systems that oppress or continue to oppress people on the basis of algorithms and uh, computer science that we don't fully understand the ramifications of. I'm in favor of a humanist intervention in emerging technology. Uh, I'm not like against drones or whatever. I am against jerks wielding drones to oppress people. Does that make sense? Um, I think we have time for maybe one last comment or question. Um, anybody uh, pro-jerk here? Uh, anybody, everybody, I feel like I'm against, we're all against jerks here maybe. Um, other thoughts, comments, things that you want to talk about? I'm sorry? Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Well, in, in the words of someone much smarter than myself, uh, you're not paranoid if you're right. Thank you all very much for your time. Good luck. Godspeed. <laughs>